hello, I'm Jonathan Zittrin. Uh, I teach at the Berkman Center uh, for Internet Society and at the Oxford Internet Institute. And um, I'm reminded of the Simpsons episode uh, where Homer's about to do a comedy routine and Smithers gets up and says, before Homer begins, let me just say that a small dog, not unlike Lassie, has been found dead in the parking lot. <laughs> and now, the comedy stylings of Homer Simpson. And uh, it didn't end well. Um, so out of that thoroughly depressing last session, in a good way, in the sense of an important way, um, we now turn to the future of news. So it's actually a perfect kind of Janus view, uh, looking backward, looking today, and, and looking forward. And we found uh, eight who appear to have transformed into seven provocateurs <laughs> to do an Agatha Christie mystery. <laughs> So seven provocateurs. Where's where's Solana? Solana? Where is the Solanosaurus? All right. Well, in, exactly. Yes. If somebody can fetch Solana Larson and tell her that um, her item is ready for pickup, that would be great. Um, so uh, to have a uh, discussion in rapid fire fashion about what's going to be at the end of our driveways, literally and metaphorically speaking. I think we pegged 2013 as sort of the let's not start thinking about genetic reconstruction uh, limit on the future of news. But each of the people here has prepared two to three minutes of smoke bomb-like observations. And of course, there's a brain trust in the room. So I just want to get us started, get some ideas out there, and start talking about it. Um, so uh, just going in basically random order, let me call upon Paul Steiger to tell us who you are, and what you have to say about the future of news. Well, I'm, I'm Paul Steiger. I'm the editor-in-chief of something called ProPublica, which um, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan investigative reporting operation. We're in the process of hiring a staff of 25 journalists to um, fill in the gap that's being left by um, the uh, buyouts and <coughs> shrinking of, of uh, newsrooms all around the country. Is your media principally text, video, multi? Um, it's, uh, it is going to be <coughs> our principal connection with the world. It's going to be the web. Um, we will uh, blog every day, aggregating other people's investigative uh, reporting and commenting on some of um, And uh, uh, we will pick uh, half a dozen areas to focus on, try to move the ball once a week. And then we will do deep dive stuff, um, which uh, we will offer free to existing platforms, meaning uh, newspapers, magazines, television, um, even other websites, where we will give them temporary exclusives. Um, uh, they're free to collect any of the revenue that they would get from, this, uh, from the stories. And our, our goal is to get maximum reach. And we're looking to sh uh, shed light on abuse of power. Most power is in the hands of um, government and business, so we'll focus there. But we'll also look at unions, at um, uh, universities and school systems, at uh, lawyers and courts, at doctors and hospitals. No sacred cows. No sacred cows, not even nonprofits. You thought we were lefty, but we don't like unions when they're not good. <coughs> That's correct. <laughs> right, got it. And. Um, and you said uh, 20, um, uh, 2013, um, when I'll be 70. Uh, so what is, the, what is the future of news? And before you have a second, just one last thing on the bio. Prior, you were in the belly of the beast, correct? Uh, if the Wall Street Journal is the beast, I was in the belly. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the answer kind of answers as well. Uh, managing editor of, of, of the journal. And, wow. Uh, so, I mean, the one thing that's uh, clear to me is that um, news will be delivered um, principally electronically. I don't mean that print will disappear. Uh, print will con continue to have important functions. But just looking at my own economics, uh, when I was at the Journal, 15% uh, of the total budget of the newspaper was um, allocated to news. The rest was um, paper, ad sales people, uh, distribution people, um, uh, uh, finance people to check up on all the other people. 
Uh, at uh, ProPublica, close to two-thirds, at least 60 percent of our budget will be focused on news. And why? Because electrons are much more efficient than wood pulp with ink sprayed on it to deliver all kinds of, uh, all kinds of information. So um, uh, you know, I, mean, I think that, that the delivery of what we do um, will still be partially in print, but more and more of it will be on the web. And we've got to figure out not just um, uh, you know, throwing stuff out there and hope people will, will pick it up, we, the, the old format of an investigative story, 10 inches on the front page of a newspaper, jumping into a double truck inside, um, uh, nobody younger than me is going to read that stuff. Um, we, it still has to be done. Uh, it still has to be part of the background. But we need to be able to communicate um, in the kind of uh, visceral imagery, um, you know, including um, video, including uh, uh, sound and sound and pictures. Right. Last question before our next provocation. It's the question that probably Tony Curzon Price in our audience has in mind. In 2013, for your organization, how are you making money? Uh, <laughs> and that's are... not the answer of uh, arriving <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> for $200, Bill. It's... We are not making money. The, the <coughs> beauty of our organization is that we are um, uh, we are funded with the notion that we will not sell advertising and we will not seek um, circulation revenue. Um, and uh, I'm sure you will achieve both of those aims. And yes, uh, I was I was very good at promoting nonprofit journalism at the Wall Street Journal. And I don't see why I can't uh, continue doing that in this in this realm as well. That's slightly more convincing the answer I thought you were going to give, which was volume. <laughs> so. All right, let's space out the Jonathans, because we have so many of them. Jonathan Taplin, tell us who you are and give us your predictions. Uh, I'm a professor at the USC Annenberg School. I was, in my earlier life, a producer of films and music with uh, Bob Dylan and Martin Scorsese, Gus Van Sant, and a bunch of other people. Uh, I want to just jump off of looking at 2013 from three comments that were made earlier. One, Richard Sandbrook's comment last night that we're suffering from information overload. Uh, I would add on to that that we may be suffering in 2013 from commercial overload. Um, the second is Dr. Weinberger's notion that the struggle will be over metadata. And that relates back to the commercial idea because the struggle will be over your metadata, your behavioral targeting information, and the ability to then deliver you specifically relevant uh, advertising for your things. And, and third, Castell's notion of commoditizing freedom, which is essentially uh, what his contention is that MySpace seems free, but really I'm mining your information on MySpace deeply to be able to then sell you a lot of stuff. So my notion of the world in 2013 will be a uh, world that's really two worlds. There will be a world for the rich, which will be a world of content on demand paid for by the piece in the same way that I still pay for the Wall Street Journal online. Uh, uh, essentially personal walled gardens, and you know, where the equivalent of I would only use Facebook mail, in other words, only people who are in my world are allowed to communicate with me, and this would be an ad-free world but I'd have to pay through the notes for that. Uh, the other world for everyone else would be a world in which advertising would be so much a part of your life that you could not make a phone call without having a 15 second ad um, before you made the phone call. Uh, you may laugh at this, but the notion of if you try free 411 service, you listen to a 15 second ad before you're able to be getting any information for free as to a phone number that you want. So uh, clearly many big companies are going to be in this business of mining your information and just whether you want to opt in or out of that system may not be as easy a choice uh, as you think it is. Now on the flip side of this, clearly newspapers, big 
important uh, journalistic operations will help you through the information overload. And your willingness to surrender to them your data in order to get a kind of personalized media experience and a personalized advertising experience may be a good thing. And it certainly may be the savior of the online newspaper. But I'm not positive about that. And is this two-tiered world a dystopia? You have this kind of overtone of scariness about you, but well, uh, <laughs> that's a turn of heart. I, I, think it, I, I think it's potentially dystopian. I mean, my students, my undergrads, think there's absolutely no problem with surrendering a huge amount of demographic information in return for cheaper content. Yeah. And, and that may be totally right. But I also think that the, you know, we're so marketed to right now that if every move that you make has a personalized message on it, every phone call you make, every web search you make, I'm not sure that's a world that I want to live in. And maybe I have enough money to opt out of that world into a world where I'm protected. I'm in my own personal kind of HBO world that has no advertisements, and I'm in my wall garden, and I have no spam, I have nothing, I can't be reached unless I want to be. Uh -huh. Jennifer Farrow. Wow, I need to follow that. I have a much cheerier uh, outlook. Flying cars. Well, <laughs> that's what I thought. That was, the future of news, cool. flying cars. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> With um, ads. OK, so no flying cars. Um, so what I see really is a convergence of devices and platforms. And I'm in public radio. I, I'm at KCRW, um, which is public radio in Southern California. And um, we're already seeing that. I, I just I really see that devices will become less relevant. So radio, um, you know, will s I, I just don't see people carting around radios. I think they'll all devices will all come <coughs> together. So all these laptops that you're using and your phones and I mean it's already happening. That's not a big pred prediction, but. What I think that means for a place like KCRW is that we just have to look at our content in slightly different or many different ways at the same time. So that's what we're doing. So you think in this future your license to broadcast may be irrelevant? <coughs> Not irrelevant, just less important. So right now the way, this is a divergent, I hope I get more than two minutes, but, but right now the way a This lot will of not be docked against your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there'll be a lot of ads I have to sit through, right? For, um, so what public radio is like across the country in a lot of places is that there's lots of sticks around, and then they all take national programming and spit it back out there. And in in what we're seeing today, where where people, you know, where where national producers can bypass sticks, radio stations like myself, you can just go get NPR from NPR. You don't have to go through KCRW and stuff or through a pledge drive or some weird announcer or anything like that. Um, so what, what KCRW is trying to do, what, what we're focused on is, is taking what content we have, figuring out what we can provide, repackaging it and spitting it out in many different ways so that we can be relevant to people who only want to use their phone or just their laptop or they only want to read or they just want to watch or they want to listen. So that's, that's where I see it going. I see radios being less and less relevant. Um, and then once the internet comes in cars, um, then, then we're, you know, forget radio. You are representing the LA automobile culture very well here. <laughs> but you know there's going to be internet and cars and there's going to be people like driving. Like they are now. I, I drive down this freeway and I see people, I saw a guy grading papers uh, on the 10. <laughs> and we weren't going slow. I couldn't believe it. I was like, and then he was texting, you know, I don't know when he was driving, but I was, I stayed away from him. Yeah. It's very scary. Okay, so th here's my other thing. Um, so I also believe that, that this notion of us going on the internet is going to disappear. I think that the internet is always going to be on, and we're just going to be on the internet. It won't be that thing over there. Um, and I don't know what that means, but I'll move to the next thing. Um, one thing that I heard Mark Cooper talking about, I'm really glad he said it, because in um, media, like we're in public radio, a lot of you guys are talking about citizen journalism and, and uh, being egalitarian, and everybody should blog and all this stuff. Um, you find that when you're trying to run a radio station, for instance, that it does matter if people listen or read or care about what's being said. And so I, I do believe that in the future, um, the cream will always rise to the top. And that, that will always happen, no matter how wide open the distribution network is. Um, I think that good is always going to be good, and people who consume that are going to want to experience good stuff. Um, 
And I also think that people will continue to search for relevance and for trusted sources. And that's something that KCRW have always prided ourselves on is, you know, that kind of um, that kind of approach that someone was talking about in the monetized section, which is that you know, the, you you want to turn to someone to find out why should I, what should I really be paying attention to? Uh, we look at our at KCRW as an influencer, and we're going to try to keep doing that. And I think that no matter how many millions are 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 giving you content, um, there's going to be one place that a lot of people will go to find out what's important. Um, and I also think. Um, that advertising will be more ubiquitous, but I also think that nobody's really going to care, and I don't think they care right now. Okay, so in a word, convergence yes. with quality layers on top. Yeah, quality which matters. Which are represented by KCRW. <coughs> yes. So just keep doing well, what you're doing. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, Jonathan Krim. I'm Jonathan Krim. I'm in charge of all the local news operations for WashingtonPost.com, so I'm the evil mainstream media guy up here. Um, my view is that mainstream media is going to abandon what has been the traditional form and structure of storytelling for the last 50 to 60 years, um, which is based on a posture of objectivity uh, in which we largely sort of derive our credibility from keeping score within stories uh, between points of view and we seek to essentially attribute all point of view to others. Um, our favorite of course is blah 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 comma critics say. Um, <clears throat> and I, I feel pretty strongly that both the blogosphere, cable television and actually some visionaries in print like Paul Steiger um, who began to pioneer the notion of much more analytical, uh, much more conclusionary journalism, what I call declarative journalism. I, I'm hoping it's going to be the era of declarative journalism, in which reporters are free to write what they know, um, <clears throat> and in which uh, still very important is the quality of their reportage. That is essential. And it's still going to be important that they reflect in their stories, that they have considered the other side, if there's just one, or whatever is the countervailing set of opinions or facts, but that at the end of the day, the he said, she said form is no longer useful for readers. And in fact, as with probably many people in this room, you don't really believe we don't have notions of what's right and wrong already and that we tend to sort of find clever ways to sort of show what that is. Now the, the sort of interesting fallout of this is that we're going to approach something much more like what you see in newspapers around many parts of the world. Um, party press is not a term I love, but it's closer to that. And you see it in, in certain magazines in this country, certainly magazines like The Atlantic and The New Yorker and and so on and so forth. Um, but I, I actually believe that the, the, the credibility of the journalists will be enhanced in this case, but it may also be that publications are in general much more identified with a particular point of view than they are today. And that's going to be particularly interesting at a more local level. I think for the national press, this is beginning to happen already. You see it in the New York Times. We're we're not there yet, and I should say that I am speaking for myself and not my company. Um, but uh, if you think about a mid-market newspaper, or the Cleveland Plain Dealer, or the Detroit Free Press, or any of those, it's, it's interesting to sort of contemplate what that means when a reporter can go to a school board meeting uh, and begin to write what is a very different kind of story than what they have traditionally written. and how the community will respond to that. But I do think that what it will mean is a greater opening for wider sourcing and more public participation. Lisa Williams. Hi. You've asked to go to this particular place, yes, thank you. which looks like a wonderfully subversive way to sneak in a PowerPoint slideshow. <laughs> I 
really terrible jet lag, and this sort of helped me remember what it was that I was going to say. But yeah, what I wanted to say is um, like, uh, 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 like Jennifer and Paul, I, I don't work for a newspaper, and I never have, and so uh, I'm actually much more optimistic and less depressed. So you know, I'm a little, I'm a little less worried about that sort of thing. Um, but I actually think that journalism will survive the death of its major institutions. As a person coming out of high tech, all of the things that's happening to journalism look really familiar to me. Um, high tech went through a massive simultaneous crack up of a lot of its institutions in the late 80s, and there was a lot of talk about, well, geez, America won't be on top anymore. You know, Japan will come in and take over. Now, that's pretty silly when you say that, and 10 years later, you have Google's IPO. I think, in essence, what's going to happen is that um, what's happening is that we're becoming the same industry. And thus, the career norms that I experience as a person who's always worked in high tech will become the career norms of journalists. So there'll be much shorter job tenures. There'll be fewer Titanics and more kayaks like Paul's. Um, the good thing about this, everybody sort of focuses on bad things. But geez, how are we going to have people for you? One of the great things is that we'll give you totally new ways to address stories that are really important. Um, I think one of the best pieces of journalism that came out last year was the Walter Reed story. Um, but because of the limitations of even the best newsrooms, um, it always gives somebody, some weasel, the opportunity to stand up in a podium and say, this is really an isolated incident. <laughs> right? Whereas there's one story that's really hard to cover in the newsroom context that I think could be covered once the New York Times and um, Google are sort of one and the same, which is, um, the Iraq war has returned 6,000 amputees. I have one question. How many of those amputees have been um, issued their prostheses and had them fitted? That's an important question. It's very difficult to cover out of a single newsroom. You know, and a lot of our problems are like that. Um, public health issues, global warming, okay? So um, technology outside of the newsroom gives you really new ways to cover um, issues that are really important that I think are sort of undercovered or hard to cover in a really compelling way that way, okay? So how to make money, okay, I'll just give you sort of one insight about how high-tech firms make money now that you're going to be one. Um, news organizations take things that are free, like public meetings, you know, you can go to a lot of it's public information, right? I'm not talking here about access journalism, I'm mostly talking about local journalism. Um, and then they add value to them by adding editorial value. They edit them down, they make them into this nice package, and they deliver it to my doorstep. Web organizations that make a lot of money typically took things that used to cost a lot of money or that individuals couldn't buy and make them free. So if you have an idea that's like that, it's probably a good sign. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Peter Sklar was here before, and I, um, I don't see him in the audience, but he actually stood up at the last session to um, defend the primary unit of citizen journalism. I refer, of course, to the cat picture. <laughs> um, community is about shared, lived experience. And most Americans are extraordinarily fortunate. Their experience of being in a particular place and being alive there when they walk out the door isn't news because they don't live in a war zone and they're not celebrities. Neither of these tragedies have befallen them, right? So, but news is always a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that lived experience. So what you get when you sort of wrap community around a news source is a more, um, is, a, is a much more comprehensive whole. So, you know, learn to love and embrace your cat pictures. It's all, you don't have to put them on the front page, honestly. Okay? And that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Uh, David Cohn, would you like me to pull up your Twitter feed? Uh, no, that's all right. Okay. Just um, I thought you might tweet your way through your <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, That's actually, uh, Lisa's is actually, I guess, good for me to, to bounce off of. My name is David Cohn. I work with uh, newsassignment.net and also newstrust.net. Um, so, uh, it, it's very, uh, I'll, I'll try and sort of blast through this, but um, I have two mantras. One is that uh, uh, the future is going to be open and distributed, and the second one is that journalism is a process, not a product. Uh, news institutions, uh, as we know them right now, their product, newspapers, are failing. But journalism as a process, I think, is alive and well right now and will continue to be, you know, is going to survive, as Lisa said, you know, what's going on right now. So the question is, is how does open how can how does that process become more open and more distributed? Um, and some of the uh, you know ideas of how I see the future are actually almost counterintuitive, non-tech. Um, right now, news institutions have physical space um, that are closed off. They're they're sort of. I tried to go to the San Francisco Chronicle the other day, and I wasn't allowed in essentially. Um, <laughs> But Wait, you know, th th this was like ironic to you. Well, uh, well, it, but but why shouldn't the the San Francisco Chronicle be like a library? 
uh, open to the public. Um, you know, in the future, uh, I see newsrooms, the physical space, as a library, even a cafe almost. You can go there, maybe there's some kiosks, Perhaps and if you want to find out. Park. What? <laughs> well, no, no, to the extent that, that it, it, they're a source of information about your community. Um, you can even talk to someone, a reporter there, who is well-versed in all the other bloggers in the area. And so you can come and say, well, I'm really curious about the history of, you know, my actual library. And then they can tell you about what, you know, the most recent things. Um, now, that's just the physical space. And again, it's counterintuitive. Um, you know, maybe you'll take your hoverboard there, but... Um, you know, I don't see why newsrooms, uh, you know, can't sort of open up to the public, or, be, or even if it's just every three months, have town hall meetings, so, so to speak. Um, but that's one way that, that the physical space of newsrooms can become open and distributed. Um, I also think that the business model, uh, in a sense, can become open and distributed. Um, it's a, I have a sort of cheerier um, version of, of what you were talking about, where it's not walled gardens, but maybe cooperative owning. Um, you know, you can, uh, if you take small donations, right, like, you know, $2 from 2,000 people, then you're able to sort of uh, get something that's ad-free um, that has, you know, real editorial value to it. Um, and I don't think $2 is, is uh, you know, uh, too much to ask of people. So, it's, I mean, it's you're giving them, I suppose. Right. Well, you know, if you, if you add, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, there's always this talk of uh, collective wisdom, but there's the power of collective pocketbooks, too, um, which I think journalism hasn't tapped into 100%. Um, and then there's also, you know, in terms of content, right? So that's the business model. I talked about the physical locations making that open distributed. What about the content, right? Which is really what journalism in the end is about. The, the, the final part of that process is the, the final content. How do you make that open and distributed? And, uh, and Richard talked about networked um, journalism. Um, and again, that's, uh, it's, it's local, but it's also national. Um, things like uh, the environment. Um, you can get people to report on their local environment, right, and local environmental degradations, but to the sense that you aggregate that, you have something that is of, of tremendous value, more than the little stories. And I don't see why in, in, in my extreme sci-fi world, although it won't happen anytime soon, um, news organizations are sharing these stories, this content, right, um, to the extent that, you know, local paper gets their scoop about environmental degradation, but they sort of aggregate it together so that, you know, they sort of create this um, wealth of information that is greater than any of the sums. Uh, um, now, right now, they, we're still in this mentality of scoops, and uh, you know, it's my information, I, I hoard it. Um, but, you know, uh, on the internet, if you're a silo, you're screwed. Um, and so news organizations can almost, in a sense, create uh, uh, an associated newsrooms, kind of, uh, instead of the associated press, you have this collective uh, um, sort of idea on what stories need to be covered at a national yeah. local level. Can't tell if it connects with Paul's idea of the temporary exclusive or the tenth-clusive. Uh, it sounds like that's sort of the same thing, uh, but maybe not. I, well, I don't know. I, I, is it okay if we go into a more engaged... Uh, I, I well, know, what, all what right. What do you mean by temporary <laughs> exclusive? <laughs> I don't know. We'll strap in. I, I, I'd like to hear what, what, what that means exactly, temporary exclusive. Uh, temporary exclusive, um, if you remember the charts from... Uh, th this morning, uh, where you where you saw that that uh, on mainstream media the uh, sites the biggest hits were all in the first couple of days. Well, um, basically, what we would offer someone who is has got great reach, and and this is before your world arrives, um, and uh, uh, and in return they get to in. To collect the inventory, you know, including putting it on their website. All we'll do on our website is is put the headline and the first paragraph and link to them. And then after two days, let's say, uh, we'll post it on our site. We'll archive it. We will put additional background and we will follow up. And we'll get the long tail. Um, and since we're not collecting revenue, we don't care. Uh, but we'll, but we'll get the we'll get the additional reach, and the the virtue of that process uh, uh, as a supplement to the process you're talking about is that it's it's very difficult um, on an aggregated basis to go beyond collecting facts or interviews on the same topic. If you if you want to go deep into a subject, uh, I think it, most of the time requires a fairly powerful um, central intelligence to um, have interviews that are accretive 
rather than are horizontal. So, so you know, those are two sort of supplementary and important parts of the journalistic uh, journalistic package. That my answer would be uh, quick. Uh, yeah, it's it's very much related. Um, it's uh, again. Uh, the mantra is, how do you take the process of journalism? The process for me is collecting information, filtering information, and distributing information. And to the extent that technology makes those all, it changes them, we'll say. Um, how do you make them more open and distributed? In, in, uh, against, which goes against sort of the tradition that we normally have right now. Got it. Thanks. John Funabiki. <coughs> Okay, so I'm uh, John Funabiki. I'm a professor of journalism at San Francisco State University, uh, where we have 650 journalism majors, and I can't figure out where they're going to go work. Um, but they love doing what they're what what they're doing, and we're trying to figure that out uh, with them. Um, I want to take the opportunity to try to maybe uh, inject a couple different ideas in, into here, and so I'm going to change the question. It's not what will news look like, but what will happen to our, what will be happening to our communities? Um, and I think that a lot of our news and information and civic dialogue will center around passion, will be passion driven. I can, because I think that we're all really interested in what is not only relevant to our lives, but is intimate to our lives. We're seeking connection. Um, and what we see in the, in the new media world is that we're, we're looking for the things that, 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 that appeal to our passions and that the media producers are covering the things and producing the things that appeal to their passions. And where they connect, uh, we, get, we get sparks. So let me take off three trends that I think are really interesting um, and that, that are particularly interesting to me because I kind of look at things from the ground up rather than from the, the sky down, which, we, which has, been with the, has been a fantastic experience uh, so far today. Uh, first of all is growing, increasing um, uh, demographic diversity in the United States, powered by globalism, creating, as you know, as soon as you step outside the building, incredibly large and, 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 and uh, energetic ethnic communities, Chinese, Spanish, um, Arabic, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that everywhere. Second, an incredible explosion of ethnic news media. And I'm happy to see that there are ethnic news media representatives. Um, um, A little here. louder, please. I'm, I'm incredibly excited to see that we have ethnic media representatives here. Um, those of you who are from the Bay Area, where I am, know that uh, Dean Singleton owns nearly every single daily newspaper in the Bay Area, save the San Francisco Chronicle, which David could not break into. Um, and so it's quite, it's quite, when you look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, a map of the Bay Area and, and look, at, look at Singleton's ownings, uh, ownership, ownership, uh, holdings, it's, it's kind of scary. But if you do something that I just did was to count off the number of ethnic news media outlets, homegrown, community grown, in print, radio, television, web operations, I counted in the Bay Area more than 200, working in more than 25 languages. These are our media outlets that are contributing to their and catering to the passions of their communities. Uh, and I really do speak, I, I really underscore the word passion. The second, third trend, demographic diversity, ethnic news media outlets growing. The third trend is the increasing um, uh, practice of community-based and non-profit organizations to be using tools of media. So, of course, websites and publications, et cetera, et cetera. But increasingly using journalistic storytelling, narrative storytelling forms, short storytelling forms, uh, films, um, to talk about their work, to try to move their communities in certain directions, to try to deal with with the needs and, and services that are needed in those communities, and those are those are contributing to the kind of the civic change that's going on. So you have to couple the ethnic news media with this more uh, community-driven, community-produced media, which may or may not be news, which may or may not be journalism, but is is contributing 
to this civic dialogue that's going on. Um, and so I, that, I see those three things coming together to really shape at least one aspect of this media sphere that we have going. Um, and I think if we were to expand the way we're talking about, not be so media-centric, but be more community-focused, um, we might, uh, might find some new things to talk about. Got it. And by the way, these communities you think of as ethnic, but also regional then, or it might not be regional. Yeah, ethnic, uh, identity-based, cultural. Um, and you can expand this notion of community to communities of interest as well. So whether you're a, a vegan, right, um, or a, a, a religious or a spiritual uh, uh, focus, right. uh, you can see that as well. Uh, and that's why I say that I think that a lot of the media that will be coming out will be more passion driven. Got it. Solana Larson. Uh, hi. My provocation is uh, shaped. And tell us just a little about your background first, sorry. It's shaped by my experience as managing editor of Global Voices, uh, where I've been for about nine months, and previously before then as a commissioning editor with Open Democracy for almost five years. Uh, I'd like to preface it with a, a story. Uh, I was in the car here a couple of days ago, and actually it was yesterday, listening to BBC World Radio, and there was a report from China, a correspondent in Beijing, who uh, wanted to tell the story of a press tour that the Chinese government organized into Tibet. The problem was that the journalist from the BBC was not actually allowed to go on this tour. So the story got complicated by that, and, and what he wanted to say was that Western journalists went on a tour and the tour was interrupted in Tibet by a group of protesting Tibetan monks. That was the story. But since he wasn't there, he had to borrow some audio that was recorded from an, by another journalist, and then he interviewed the other journalist about the experience of being on this propaganda tour in Tibet. <coughs> and both of them seemed to be uh, trying to give the appearance that they knew what was going on. And all I could wonder was, first of all, why is this news? Why are these two, you know, one Brit, one Australian, why are they trying to give the impression that they understand what's happening? And why don't they talk to some local people? And I understand that, you know, it's hard when you're a foreigner, you come, you don't know whether you talk to a local person and they might want to dupe you. They might be trying to uh, use you for their own purposes to push a story and essentially one of the issues that comes up is, is one that you get asked a lot when you work with bloggers. How do you know who you're talking to? How do you know who to trust? How does a journalist know that they can trust an ordinary Chinese or Tibetan person? Well, the answer to that uh, is by knowing the region that they're writing about, by knowing and understanding something about the culture and the local context, which is why my provocation is that in 2013, there will be no foreign correspondence. And by that, I do not mean that a Brit or an American or a Danish Puerto Rican can't write about what's going on in China or in Africa or in Asia. It simply means that we will no longer have this parachute style of journalism where someone flies in, pretends to understand what's going on, and goes back out. It, it, it you know, the, the merging of, uh, <laughs> the merging of, of you know, having different cultures meet is really great. I mean, I'm not saying that somebody, a foreigner can't write about a situation and, and draw out some analysis, which is really useful to a home audience. What I'm saying is that we will have, uh, hopefully, a world where the journalists will understand the language in the country that they're reporting about, that they will be able to read the local newspaper, and that they'll be able to give you this kind of, of informed commentary and analysis about what's happening. And this is something that we at Global Voices do um, you know, to the extent that we can with bloggers. We have regional editors who are trying to work with, with locals to understand a, a, a very local situation. And I think if the mainstream media applied some of this to their coverage, we might you know, be able to understand more of what's going on. And just to, to conclude, I mean, I think 
the, what's happening in Tibet right now is a particularly good example of why this is definitely going to happen. Because locals now, um, to a wider extent than I think was possible before, are able to follow the news coverage themselves. So the idea that a, a CNN correspondent can write or report whatever they want and never have to report back to what Chinese people are saying or Tibetan people or, you know, all of a sudden they're now accountable to a global audience even when they're reporting for local media. And that largely has to do with the internet and the fact that people are expressing themselves in citizen media worldwide. So Solana, let's use your provocation uh, as a jumping off point. I can't tell if you are agreeing or disagreeing, or perhaps in parts yes and no, with Jonathan Krim's views, because Jonathan was saying that the future might hold, to his relief I think, more declaratory journalism, where you can just say what you know, rather than having to go find a peasant to say it, and then say some people say. On the other hand, your whole point is, Maybe we don't need people to come in and say, I do declare, but rather there's people already there who can get their voices outward globally, as it were. Yeah, it, it's, it's a more subtle point. I mean, I think there, there will continue to be many different forms of journalism, but I, f I just find the notion that, oh, well, sorry, we can't have any news from Madagascar because we don't have any journalists on the ground there. I find that notion to be absurd because there are journalists who live in Madagascar. But of course that's a different that's a different point though. That's well, there are already no foreign correspondents in Madagascar. It's, it's similar because yeah. you know there are also oh well we can't cover this region of Iraq. There yeah. are journalists in Iraq. So it's about using uh, that information. I mean yeah. I, th I still think you can have these notions of factual. You can yes. still have he said he said she said yes. uh, so and so reported but by using different kinds of sources and accepting that journalism can come from people who aren't white yeah, or yeah. aren't Western educated right. is, is part of it. So here's another question uh, that I, is free for the whole panel, I think, also launching off of what you said and hearkening back to the depressing montage in the movie that we saw before our panel began, which is part of what I heard people fearing losing as journalists were getting laid off, was people who subscribe to a certain set of professional standards and who hew to them 24-7. Your identity is as a journalist and you can't be bought off even after the office closes and you go home. In your view, is there still room for people to separate themselves from the rest of the public and hold themselves to a profession that says that when I express my view, I have certain obligations or limitations, or is that? You know, absolutely. Um, I, I would not suggest that um, <clears throat> we turn reporters into opinion mongers. Um, I think it's more about the voice and structure and the form of our storytelling, which right now, I believe, is contributing to a sense and, and you know, that movie notwithstanding, voters are, or readers are voting with their feet about newspaper readership. So, uh, and I think, unfortunately, our, our structure, which was born out of very high ideals about that separation, um, is, is less useful and less credible uh, than someone who still needs to do all of the reporting, still may quote people in a story, uh, but is much more free to uh, declare what they've learned and what they know in definitive terms instead of this sort of, uh, you know, we're just going to sort of lay out bits for you and then we're going to let you decide. Um, and it's just less useful. The other Jonathan. I, I just think that during the last uh, 24 hours, the three most interesting stories have all been from nonprofit organizations. So the BBC, ProPublica, and Global Voices. And, you know, it seems to me that what's needed and what's so missing is some way to finance more nonprofit journalism. Because, I mean, as we all know, our public media systems are dying. And they're dying because they're being starved. From and what do you think of David's Ask Everybody for $2 model? Well, I mean, obviously that's what PBS tries to do, right? You have, you have pledge drives every quarter. Um, he might have had something more like a tip jar in mind. I don't know. It's, it's a tip jar, but, well, here's my, here's like, I will, you'll even take me, and you guys can all shame me for this. Like, I haven't donated to NPR because, to me, ah, there it is. I, I, I know. I suck. But here's, here's why. Let me, let me explain my re 
Well, well, let me explain my reasoning. I'm donating to this large uh, organization that holds up journalistic principles, right? And I'm afraid of, well, what if I'm just donating to a $40,000 stapler, right? Um, I, I want to create, I, I envision, I envision a, a more direct access. Is it a named stapler? Uh, <laughs> exactly. But I mean, like what's, what, Solana, what Solana was talking about was like a distributed and open newsroom. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, the, the, your original question that, that started this discussion, which is now gone new way, was, was um, you know, how do we keep them up to professional standards? And to some extent, someone earlier, I forgot who said, you know, the cream rises to the crop. And I think it's a, a false assumption to say that if you do open it and you do make it open and distributed, that you're going to end up with all this crap. Granted, the technology has to come in to allow filtering, right? I mean, it's not like, you know, uh, but that's the... I, Take newspapers as a product away. We no longer have newspapers as a product. So the, what, we, what journalism does is a service. Journalism, in the end, is a process, and that's a service. So one of the services can be journalist as guide. Another service can be journalist as host of a conversation, a physical host or on, a long, online community. So uh, we need to rethink our services. David, I think uh, you've just put it back into Jennifer's lap because I think she was the one who had such serenity about the idea that the best stuff would rise to the top. Well, I just, what did what you I, mean I when you say, said rise and top? What did those mean? Well, first of all, I mean quality will trump quantity always. By trump, you mean I will mean become more people, salient in the public eye? People will are going to read good for? stuff. They're not going to read or consume crap. And what I also mean, though, well, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything that anybody in this room does is crap. One person's crap can be someone else's quality. Until you said that, I don't think people thought that's what you were saying. <laughs> Why did they do it? They were doing because they believe there's a bunch of people outside the room <laughs> watching Fox News right now. <laughs> I, I guess, let me just get to the point. If you feel like listening, stay with me. And no, not just keep they're listening. twittering yeah. on your laptop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what okay, now you're insulting say. people in the room. <laughs> But they wouldn't hear me because they were they were IMing their friends. Anyway, um, no. What what I also want to say about that is it doesn't rise automatically or by itself. There are editors and producers and people who make those choices. And as egalitarian as we all want to be, the, uh, people must make those choices for other people. The, you, a, a good writer just doesn't happen to just expose him or herself. Someone grabs them out. And what I think will happen is there's there's many more options for people who would never be able to walk into the San Francisco Chronicle to now, you know, say, hey, I'm Fair enough. Right. This is David's collection, filtration, distribution. And on the filtration part, you're right, that's a very powerful element of the story. I just, I'm wondering what you have to say to the skepticism that the filtration is selecting to meet a market demand, oh, which to, wants though. to hear about things that the particular people in this room think is not cream at top. Now, there well, might but, be a disconnect. But I, I, don't I don't think know. you can argue against what people want to consume. And, and wow. It's just amazing for the NPR person well, to say. Well, I mean, Anil and I, my um, new media director from KCW, and I were just talking outside. And, you know, ideas are a marketplace. People, the free market will decide what people want to talk about. And if it's, you know, as my six-year-old said, Britney Spears who shaves her head, you know, or, or if it's, you but know, so Clinton's that, health policy. Does that mean the cream rises to the top or the top rises to the top? Do you have an top independent rises. view of the cream? What's the top? What do you mean? The top means the most popular, the most valued. Is, is there a definition of quality news or quality information independent of what the market votes as such? Well, yes. I mean, I think it's a two-part thing. Okay. I think there's quality because there's a way to tell a story that's compelling. Um, there's a way to see a story that's compelling. That's what's going to rise to the top. But I also want to just make sure I reiterate, reiterate that you do still need editors and producers that choose what is good. And, and it's and a lot of it's the reason why I think certain blogs are so popular is because they have a personality. And you know, I connect with that person. Therefore, what, what you say, I like who you are. I like what you're about. Therefore, what you're about to tell me or show me is something I know I'm going to like too. And so that's where... Me at KCRW, I, that's what I worry about. But I want to also talk about this tip jar thing because I, I, everybody said this before. But you know, collecting two dollars from two thousand people is only four thousand dollars, and I'll tell you, there's not ten people who can pay their mortgage based on that, and that's something we all have to acknowledge. And, it and I'm not buying forty thousand dollars staplers, <laughs> but um, but I do have you know seventy people that work at, at KCRW who want to 
live and do what they do. And I think it's important and we have to quantify that and it has to be something that's valuable and that people pay for. So. Can I just add real quick? Yeah, yeah quickly, and then let's get other voices in who haven't spoken. One before. quick thing about filters is there's different types of filters, right? Um, Dig is a filter. When I want to read fake Steve Jobs, I go to Dig, and there's a fake Steve Jobs list, and it's great. I wouldn't call it journalism, obviously. So really, it is about providing different types of filters and meeting the demands of, of you know. And do you see Dig as pointing the way towards the future? Well, I, I wouldn't call say Dig is you know. Uh, uh, dig is a fascinating thing, and it is a filter, right? It's a filter of a sort, but when you say, I'm digging something, that's really vague. I don't know what that means to dig something other than to say that, right, subvert and profit. Perfect example. I, I understand that there's going to be a constant battle. I mean, police officers have to fight gangs, and then there's that scaling up war. But this here is a, it's, it's, it's all it's, private it's a, it's, it's a code. It's a coding war yeah. between, you know, subvert and profit and, and dig, the same way that it's like, you know, a war of, of arms in the real world. I mean, I'm not saying that it's going to be perfect. But dig is a filter um, of, of a nature, right? Um, I think it can be gamed easier, easier um, because digging is vague. Now, but this is all a side argument. I'm just, I wanted to bring up the point that there's different types of filters that you can introduce to meet different demands. Got it. There are people in this vicinity who may not just be passing the time leaning against the wall, but ready to go to the mic. Is that true? Yes. Please. <laughs> The, the two uh, BBC journalists who were talking about something they didn't know, and it, I just thought, well, this is kind of like this panel here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I just wonder if anybody... We call that conclusory journalism. <laughs> if, if anybody, if you'd all address uh, the television journalism in 2013, we sort of, somehow television hasn't appeared much around in this conference. Anybody want to speak to television journalism? Has television converged? Is it still a separate creature? Is it? Tel television, well, I mean, my sense is that the, the 500 channel universe will have disappeared by 2013. In other words, there will not be 10 cable TV news channels. <coughs> that much more of this will be brought to you on demand on a video on demand basis. So, so I think the proliferation of voices in, in terms of the cacophony of, of cable blobbiating will, will have disappeared. Solana. I, I think in 2013, we won't be that obsessed with format. Whether it's television or radio or text, or it, it will become less interesting and relevant. Those divisions will be um, fluid, I think. It will be about information content, and I think uh, journalists and others who, who provide information will choose the medium that lends itself best to telling stories. Do you think we'll be less or more obsessed with institutional brand? I don't know what the format is, but I get it all from Fox. Well, the Washington Post will be a TV system. Right, but still uh, a brand. I was just gonna, yeah, I, I was just gonna say, I, I, I'm almost, I always think about this almost from the reverse, which is, I wonder if in 2013, the dominant internet experience is going to be essentially like a television experience. It will be dominantly video. In one way, if by that you mean television. No, I mean the internet experience will be much less oriented around text yeah. as it is today. But still possibly two-way video then. Yes, okay. uh -huh, absolutely. Got it. So over here. Uh, hi, it's Richard Sandler from the BBC. Um, two things. Uh, firstly, I agree with Solana. I think that the model of foreign correspondent is way overdue for being completely reinvented. Uh, and I think that's partly because of globalization and diversity and some of the things that happened before. And the notion of you know, a white Westerner flying in to report on something they don't know anything about is just not acceptable about. You know. So that's one reason. I think the other reason is one of authenticity. And, and the idea of the blow-dry, expensively suited dish monkey standing on the hotel roof, and that's not journalism, and everybody knows it's not journalism, and therefore we all, and the BBC's guilty of it like everybody else, but you know. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it's just not going to be acceptable in, in, I hope, five years time, so I agree with you. Let me just add that the World Service has 400 indigenous stringers that we mainly use, and I don't know what yesterday's issue was. Um, the second point, but it's related, is to pick up Jonathan Crim's point about decorative journalism. Uh, and I, and I, I said a little bit yesterday, I think we're getting a terrible model about opinion versus impartiality and so on. Uh, and the BBC, we have our organs of opinion surgically removed when we join the organisation. We're not allowed to have any. 
However, having said that, um, there's a big difference in my view between impartiality and objectivity. And, and, and objectivity for me is about evidence and evidence-led journalism. Uh, and I think, I say to reporters in the BBC, you can say anything you want as long as you provide the evidence to support it. And then the viewer or listener can decide whether they agree with that interpretation based on the evidence you give them. So evidence-led journalism, which could be decorative or whatever you want it to be, I think is absolutely essential. And I really feel that the kind of technology that we're having and what the internet can provide and absolutely global voices or the 400 stringers in the world service, if we can stop turning this stuff in on ourselves and point it outwards again, we can get to an evidence-led journalism, which I think could be you know, a real breakthrough and very healthy. And in 10, 15 years, do you see BBC still as a global brand for news, or will it have disaggregated? The various stringers can just pipe directly out. Oh, I think there'll still be a brand, yes, called BBC. I hope so, anyway. Yeah, no, I think there will be. <laughs> Pay my pension. <laughs> <laughs> that was impartial, but not objective. <laughs> Reactions. Um, one, I, I totally agree. Having once been a parachute journalist many, many years ago, I totally agree that. You have to either shout or uh, just dial off the mic a little. The model of the parachute journalist is, is, is sh should have been buried many years ago. The unfortunate reality is that it has not been buried and ser still serves a commercial purpose. The second point I'd like to make, and unfortunately will continue to serve a, a commercial purpose. I think the second point I want to make is we shouldn't, sh we shouldn't uh, fool ourselves that there will be one model, right? I mean, branding will be one strategy, but uh, uh, there will be other, aggregation will be another strategy. Uh, the the, in, the uh, local, local uh, uh, journalist um, or the freelance journalist is be will become more of a social entrepreneur if that's what he or she really wants to do. That person is gonna find a way to survive, just as I, I was just, we had a program last night with, with a documentary filmmaker. Documentary filmmakers have, have struggled with this issue of survival for much longer than kind of your mainstream journalist has. So journalists have to kind of relearn a new way of working it, unfortunately. Yeah, Paul. Oh. I wanna, ask uh, the Jonathan in front of me, um, when you were talking about the model of uh, the Washington Post and other platforms in the future as um, being devoted to declarative journalism, I, I mean, in my years at the Wall Street Journal, I was a fan of declarative journalism and often insisted that stories, um, particularly certain kinds of stories, made a point. but. Um, we were not um, uh, party linked uh, and, and in fact uh, uh, prided ourselves on the, on, the, on the fact that we weren't predictable in, in the news columns. And do you, see our, uh, do you see us moving more toward a model of the, you know, the Federalist versus the Republican and we're going to get nearly all of our news through um, uh, people who are, are objective but not impartial? Or will there still be a, a place for, for organizations that produce journalism that is both objective and impartial, um, impartial in the sense that it can fall on either side of, of political divides? I, I hope the latter, and, but I think it's going to be incumbent upon, the, if, if you follow the model of being more both conclusionary and personality driven by allowing your writers to express themselves, then it's incumbent upon organizations to have a very diverse group of thinkers in the newsroom. Um, and I couldn't agree more with Richard. It, it has to be evidence-based. So the evidence should lead you wherever it leads you. And um, you, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to always be on one side or on another side. At least I would, I would hope not. Over here. Uh, Michael Smolens of Dot Sub. Just a sort of an overriding comment, listening to all of you and the discussions over the last 24 hours, I think we are all privileged to be part of an explosive delta of change that's increasing so fast that the technology and the ability to do things that we all know important are far outpacing our bodies and our minds and our cultures and our society's ability to absorb these changes. And so I hear a frustration 
is that people don't know which is going to be the winner because they're so used to immediate gratification. And I think that that sort of a problem is only going to be getting worse. I mean, in our case, language has always been a barrier. And it's so obvious to us that everybody should embrace the fact that everybody should want to see stuff in other language. But it takes a very, very long time. And I think we all need to add a little bit of patience because the, the, the culture in this, everything will sort of evolve as the technology allows things to happen faster. And the solutions and feeling good about them are going to happen much faster than our ability as human beings to absorb them. That, yeah, that but, is a but, but Michael, here's the problem. There, there are certain people who are panicking. I mean, if you look at the LA Times newsroom, they're in full out panic. And they don't even think they can wait for the solutions. And, you know, my feeling is that these large news brands will survive because you will need, as you say, an editor. You will need someone to help to sort out all of this. But right now, they're firing people. I mean, just the little documentary clip we saw. They're, they're in total panic. They're not waiting. They yeah, have I no think, patience. I think if the only problem that we faced was the rapid pace of change, I, for one, would be a happy camper. The problem is that the rapid pace of change is threatening a lot of people's jobs, their pensions, their children's education. I mean, it's very personal as well. And so if you that's the frustration the, you hear. The music industry, the four giants of the music industry thought that they could litigate their way against file sharing. And they're down, their music industry is down 15% a year for the last. And Hulu, if you take a look at Hulu, the networks and other people said, we can't have it the way, we've got to have a site that's really accepting what it is. So I think here's an example in seven or eight years where the television and the movie industry realize if they try to do what the music industry did, they're going to get their lunch handed to them as well. So here, it took seven years, but Hulu is a perfect example of large media companies doing something that I think is a very good solution as opposed to waiting for small entrepreneurs to do it. Got it. Lisa, you've been patiently waiting to get in. I'll get you a microphone. Oh. Thank you, though. Um, actually, you know, uh, when you got, uh, I was struck by your comment that you have 650 students and you don't know where they're going to go. But for you guys who work at Annenberg, I have a challenge for you. I think this would be really great. You say you have 650 students. Imagine how great it would be if they all applied to work at Google at the same day. Right? I mean, why wait around for, you know, the internet to invade your newsrooms and crush them? Counter invade. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody talks about Google News, but, you know, honestly, um, if that weren't associated with Google, I don't think anybody would really consider it a very good product. Um, lots of journalism can be practiced in places that, you know, don't look like newsrooms today. And the secret about those places, which if you don't know already, because I work in those places, is they're stuffed with liberal arts graduates. You don't have to be a computer scientist to work there, and the other great thing about them is there's no adult supervision. So you can just sort of get hired for anything and then, then just go kind of do what you want. <laughs> oh, they and a lot of cases. have free snacks 24 hours free a day. Free snacks 24 hours a day, and often there's yeah. a lot of funding for projects that you want to do. If you can make a good enough argument, and your argument doesn't often have to be all that great. Right over here. Hi, I'm Sahaf from um, Real Girls Media, and I wanted to comment on... Um, what you said about content, um, good content rising to the top. I actually completely agree with that, and I think the best example is the music industry, where we've had great music come straight out of the industry, come from independent, um, MySpace, and things like American Idol. I think if, if the music's great, American people... American Idol seems grassroots to you. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, uh, I wasn't asking this in a valence no, I, didn't I was just the, wanting to expand on it. I that. didn't hear the question. Uh, American Idol seems grassroots to you. No. No, but what it is, is it's, um, which leads to my next point of filtering and what types of filtering we have. There's so much content out there that I don't doubt that there's great content that doesn't have a platform or a voice. And um, I, I think that there's two ways that it rises to the top. Um, for, for our particular magazine, we, we feature, um, sorry, just to explain, we get, we get content from user generated, we get editorial content and then partner content as well. And so our editors decide which content is featured, but um, our users decide what they like. So there's two ways of this streaming. That doesn't mean there isn't great content buried deep down in the internet, but um, I think something like American Idol is a way for the people's choice versus, um, versus the curation. And I think 
at the end of the day, the good content wins. Whoever puts it out there. So. Yes. Would, would anyone think that the current TV ratings say that the, the best stuff is always rising at the top? How about Arrested Development? Well, it's, I think we have to get into a conversation about what is quality. I mean, to some, we're so used to sensationalized media in this so country. So deal or no deal is quality? It's apples and oranges. I had that debate with my father for hours. He thinks so. I don't. <laughs> but to him it is, and that's the point. If there's enough people like him that, that believe that, then yes, it is. So um, there's quality, but it's social. it has to be socialized. If you either have great content, you have an army behind you that thinks so. So that's, those, are, those are the options as I see it. Jennifer, this is your zone. Are you going to well, say something? I was just going to say that, you know, to, in response to your very smart comment there, which it was, um, <laughs> that television has a very limited distribution network. They only have 24 hours in which to broadcast. So... You know, deal or no deal, man. That's it's gonna make more money for them. But but if there's a wider distribution network, then then there's gonna be more better things. How about that? that I that I that just don't think there's a long tail in television. Sorry. Uh, I don't know anything. Just about to, uh, I mean, I, I think we're talking apples and oranges to some extent because deal or no deal is entertainment is made for entertainment. The majority of TV is. This panel sponsored by NBC. Right. Well, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, you know the. You know what I mean. I mean, the, the extent that, you know, the television is where you come after a hard day of work and zone out. Um, it's not, it's, it's entertainment, not news and it's information. It's drool or no drool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Paul. The that. single most profitable um, magazine in the Time Inc. stable is what? People. Yes. It accounts for a majority of the revenues and the profits. Now, is that Journalism, or is that entertainment? Entertainment. Both. Who says it's both? My name is Deesa Philadelphia. I'm a master's student here in public diplomacy. But before that, for eight years, I was a correspondent and reporter for Time Magazine. And I left, and then all my friends got downsized, and they closed all the bureaus. and. I'm one of those people who doesn't necessarily think that's a bad thing because I do believe that uh, there's a difference in my mind between news gathering and what becomes fully realized journalism. And I think that news gathering does need a revolution where we have ordinary people telling us uh, what doing uh, the kind of reporting that Solana talks about because they can. And I, as a reporter, I'm very, I'm, I'm happy that I can get firsthand information about what's going on in Burma from Burmese. And I think now we've got the tools for that. But um, in terms of, you know, the, um, the question of, you know, whether or not there is a, uh, of what quality is, you know, I, when Time Magazine said it was no longer a reporting magazine, it was more a news analysis magazine, that was fine with me, except I didn't think that the analysis they were providing was very good. So uh, to me, it's, it's, it's a matter of really to a, a niche where it's important to your audience defining what you are and then really delivering on that. And I think that you know, some of these changes that are happening are forcing old media to do that. And I think that's a good thing. We are running out of time. I want to have the three people still left at the mics have a chance to get in. So let's just hit it one after the other. OK, quick question. Uh, first point of information for Jonathan Kaplan. Um, uh, Virgin Mobile um, already offers a, a phone in the UK, which you can uh, make calls for free as long as you listen to ads before the call. Um, it's actually 30 seconds, not 15 seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, the future is now. Exactly. Uh, the, my question is, is, is uh, Jonathan Grimm talked about um, giving reporters a voice. Uh, do you think that that will lead people to become more attached to people rather than to news brands? 10 seconds or fewer? Um, both. How's that? <laughs> Over here. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, uh, the question was kind of, uh, what, what news do you envisage? It seems that people are asking what kind of news do they want? It seems to me there's a very elitist agenda here, which is 
we're all kind of saying what kind of lovely thing would we like and we're all talking about quality which means what we think is very good and I think that, that that's, in, that's fine you know that, that's great and I agree with what most people prescribe but we don't seem to be asking uh, what the world needs or what people want and I think one of the reasons why and I'm amazed that as an English person coming over to you know the home of capitalism it's because we seem to have forgotten the value of competition and market forces in journalism. You know, it helps you become relevant. It helps you to excel. And I think uh, the danger is that uh, we, we're abandoning that. Got it. Steve Schultz. Oh, not Steve Schultz. You sure look like Steve Schultz. Hi. Let the record show somebody not Steve Schultz is about to ask a question. Actually, uh, Chris Schultz. Anderson, but Here's, not Look, that's Steve either. Schultz over there. Just can I just say? Separated at birth. I feel like my question is anticlimactic now. Um, I just wanted to know if people in the panel and the audience are comfortable with the world in 2013, where there will be better journalism and news available for anyone who wants it, but there's no way to make anyone want anything, and the era of the omnibus informed citizen is probably gone if it ever existed. So we have to answer this with a community poll. Okay, here's the questions with moderator privilege. Put simplistically, 2013 is the world a place where if you want to know what's going on, you will find it easier to do so than today. If your answer is yes, raise your hand. If your answer is no, raise your hand. See, that's wow. A, that's a scary result, actually. <laughs> Counterintuitive would say we're all wrong, right? <laughs> Well, with that, we have the wisdom and the optimism of the crowds. There's no real way to tie this up except to say certain key words kept coming up again and again, such as quality, evidence, news, and I think lurking out there was truthiness, even though we didn't actually say it. Um, so please join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific...